Hey, it's Jose Galison. You're watching No Way Jose. Credit to Justin Campbell at jcamp1521 on Twitter for the intro. Uh, go hit him up for any of your podcasts he needs. If you're another podcaster, you want someone to, you know, do clips, uh, do intros, whatever, what have you. He's, I'm sure he's open for commissions. Uh, go hit him up. He does a lot of other big shows too. Uh, like I said, you can find me on YouTube, all major auto puckers, Aussie as well. Today, my guest is Typo of the Biting the Bullet podcast. Uh, today, if you're watching the 14th, it'll be a live stream. If not, it'll go back up public roughly about a week or so later. If you want to have access to it in the meantime, uh, you need to get, uh, become a patron at patreon.com. Just no way Jose 2020 lowest levels, two bucks, highest levels, 20, the highest level being the sponsor. You get everything at the $2 level though. But if you want those extra little perks, you're going to pay more. Uh, my sponsors are CD McRae of the whiskey and tea podcast, Jeremy of etsy.com slash shop slash raising liberty or you can follow him at twitter at jeremy rhymes mikhail thorpe of the expat money show uh if you're someone of means you're trying to move out of the country you know move towards more liberty if that's your thing he's definitely a guy go hit him up he helps people with that whether it be on his podcast or you can actually pay him for his help with his uh with his uh business um and with that like i said the uh i have typo today we are cracking into the anarchist handbook series again we're doing the josiah warren one uh we're I'm about halfway through all these uh but i'm once again asking you guys if you guys are listeners out there if you like this series uh feel free to you know give me suggestions uh whether it be on youtube the comments whether it be on twitter uh give me suggestions of people you think would be good for these i still have the godwin the prudhan spencer bakunin johan most uh kropotkin tolstoy berkman and the Tannehills all left and then obviously the michael malice one as well but i mean i think a lot of people know what the goal is for that one we'll see how that works out uh also i'm really excited about these upcoming episodes i have as well i am doing an oklahoma city bombing episode kind of you know, questioning the government narrative there. Uh, I want to really focus along the Terrence Yeeke and some of the other random people died around it too. So I'm looking to, looking forward to that. I have a guy coming on who's uh, done a lot of work on that. And he's, I think he's working on a book as well. Uh, I also am work, going to do a Duncan Lemp episode with uh, Magnus Pinvidia soon. And uh, maybe another Duncan Lemp episode as well. I'm not sure. I'm not going to announce that yet because that's a uh, that's iffy we'll see but that one the other one uh, i mean both will be awesome but the other one is something really special if it does happen and i'll i'll keep you guys informed if that is a thing that ends up happening uh yeah uh, as always make check out my other show too if you if you like this if you want more comedy type stuff go check out uh, uh tower gang or tower power hour uh it's mostly on odyssey uh because we keep getting nuked off youtube because that's the kind of show it is uh, so yeah, go check that out. Uh, go you, go check out Top Lobsters uh, merch and shit like that at toplobs.com. Use Jose at checkout for ten percent off. He's been one doing all the thumbs for pretty much all my episodes, but specifically this Anarchist Handbook uh, episode thumbnails as well. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get type type one here. Enough grifting. Let's keep this short. What's up, man? What's up, dude? That that <laughs> intro was badass. Oh, appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, let's start off. I've had you on the show before, but, uh, I mean, considering this is an Eric Sand book series, and it's also been a while, uh, be a good chance for you to introduce yourself, uh, maybe t- take a second to talk about your podcast and, you know, yourself and uh, whatever whatever you want to do in this uh, generic, you know, intro yourself type thing. So, uh, Yeah, my name's Typo. Um, I'm a vet, and me and my vet friends started a podcast, Biting the Bullet, and um, maybe it's sort of along the lines of Tower Power if your audience likes that. Um, but it's kind of like me and Luke just going, talking about random stuff or events that happen in the week. And we do it uh, one podcast a week. Every Monday it comes out, buying the bullet on pod, all podcatchers. But yeah, we just cover a weekly topic, mainly political stuff. That's kind of what we're driven by. And a lot of veteran military related stuff. Yeah, it's a good show. Uh, I've been on it. Uh, you've been on Tower Power as well, both of you guys. It is in the same vein. It's similar. It's similar but different. That's for sure. Um, all right, f- first question I want to ask you. Uh, I like this. I like this question. Depending on the guest, because uh, depending on who, some people I chose specifically for certain ones. Some people came to me. Uh, some it's a little more obvious. Some I've had you know people suggest them. Uh, for this one, I contacted you, and I want to ask you. Why do you think I picked you for this specific chapter? Uh, after like halfway through, it's well, actually, it's pretty early on when he starts going into it, but he basically eviscerates the military and the whole idea of it, especially with like the Americanism idea. 
of behind like the Declaration of Independence and everything. And he basically uses that idea and like shatters the whole belief in the structure of the military. And I thought that was pretty obvious why you chose me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I do, I mean, we'll get more into it, but I do really like the idea of how, and, and we talked a little bit before and uh, the, the purpose of the series isn't to critique these, but I definitely have logistical concerns about some of the shit he's talking about in this. But uh, I do like the idea of like, essentially uh, he's, he's almost like, a, he's like, using the military and then even in some parts like kind of like the courts and stuff as like almost like a, a virus against the state. If, like if you just make a little tweak and it's almost like if you just, you know, whether it be the cops the military, whatever, if you, if you actually had them live up to the idea of what the normal person thinks it is or is supposed to be, then it would kind of fix it. And ironically by kind of falling in line with some anarchist principles while doing that, it kind of ends up doing that. And uh, we'll get to that. Uh, I do want to start off. I know you're not a born uh, expert at all. I've had some people on the show that are like, you know, I guess you could call them experts on the given person. So I did want to give a second uh, to kind of give, let people know who this guy is. Uh, uh, he was a, he actually never referred to himself as an anarchist, but he, uh, he if you look at his uh, theories, he was very much was like an anarcho-socialist or kind of like a mutualist. So, and you can kind of see this in this as well, uh, through this, uh, this one, he does kind of talk, uh, you can kind of see the, a lot of the labor costs, uh, or labor theory of value type stuff in there. And, you know, but he's very much of the mutualist vein where it's like, yeah, he doesn't really, he kind of falls to the labor, uh, theory of value, but he's not really like a, the, like a, I don't know, he's not someone who, if you claim, make a property claim is like, I'm going to, you know, kill you or something like some, <laughs> some commies yeah. or something, you know, like. It's just kind of like, okay, well, I guess that's what you're doing, and I'll just do my own thing over here. And that's kind of how mutualists are. Uh, and mm -hmm. that's very much how he was. And and even he was did seem to have uh, – I don't think he necessarily was against the concept of property. I, I haven't read a lot of Warren, but from what I got in here, it, he seemed to have a nuanced position on property, um, which, I mean, I think a lot of that can be cleared up to the just the, the time period and where economics was at that period in time, So, which I know for a lot of us and caps, it's kind of like uh, – it kind of like you're like, what the hell? When you look at some of these older thinkers, but you realize like a lot of the uh, economic stuff we go by, it's actually, while it seems pretty obvious, it didn't really come into full force until like, I don't know, it's like the 20th century, basically. I mean, not to say there weren't people that had similar, uh, you know, economic values that we espouse earlier, but uh, yeah, I would yeah. say definitely from the, I mean, I've literally only read this chapter of his work so i'm no expert on him or anything but reading that it may seem like he did believe in some sort of property right yeah he definitely had to like um but he just i mean he reiterates multiple times in the chapter that you know you should do everything you can before you use violence or force on the person that you can and that's what he and then he but then he'll subtly drop in there like and i also kind of blame this on myself because as society we we failed to prevent him from wanting to steal or something like that and yeah. you're like okay well I understand that perspective, but, and then, so that's kind of like the, I guess, more lefty socialist view of like the anarchy, I guess. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. Let's just get like straight up, get into it. Uh, the way this thing is, were, are done. It's very weird in how it's written. It's like bullet point, uh, which makes it kind of confusing for people reading it. I don't know if that was a, something to do with the times and how they wrote it. It almost seems pointless, but I mean, I, I don't know. It, it, it it's it's a weird piece for sure. Uh, I, I don't know if that threw you off at all. Well, at all the, the way it like so it numbered and shit. But listening to the audio version definitely that threw me off. That's why I had to re actually read the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's start off with he kind of begins starts by framing. Uh, he kind of builds his idea. Uh, because a lot of this whole thing he kind of goes into the I guess the logistics is is the, guess, the best way to put this. He kind of like. But he starts off from like first principles and how we get there. And he does start from um, he kind of follows this similar vein that a lot of, uh, you know, especially like minarchists or constitutionalists kind of follow where they'll kind of start from like, you know, if this like kind of like if if this really is supposed to be, you know, a country that's a bastion of freedom, liberty, et cetera, then this would be the case. Um, so. He, he does start with the idea that, uh, um, you know, like this, like the idea is to uphold the, the declaration of independence, essentially. Uh, let me see. Look, there's a good spot to put it. Do, 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 uh, do, do. 
every I think I had a good spot. Uh, boo, boo, boo. Legitimate. Yeah. He goes, with all due deference to other judgments, I venture to assert that our present deplorable condition, like that of many other parts of the world, is in consequence of the people in general never having perceived or else having lost sight of the legitimate object of all governments as displayed or implied in the American Declaration of Independence. So it's kind of he's going by the just government theory is kind of what he's implying, you know, uh, which ironically, us as anarchists, if you follow that through to his logical, you know, logical conclusion, then, you know, in a in a and this is something Spooner goes into a lot too. The idea that if you have a uh, if you have a government that's actually set on consent was his point in there. You end up with essentially no government. So um, yeah, and it's something he goes into there. Uh, I I don't know if I mentioned it earlier too in the beginning. The and this is an important context, just like with Spooner, that uh, it was post uh, post Civil War. It was rated right that period of time, it's 1863 when this is written. So, and there's a lot of uh, talking here with that. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that before we move on, but he does start framing it from the beginning of kind of the just government type theory that a lot of uh, a lot of minarchists and stuff kind of follow. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, it's a civil war. I mean, it's a civil or post civil war, so there's a definitely a lot of egregious things the state's doing so it's understandable why he's writing about this and it i mean we can get into it later but there's some parts where he like kind of yells it at you like in the book he capitalizes uh certain phrases and and stuff and uses a lot of explanation points when he's trying to get his point across and it seems like it's perfect for the time when it's this post civil war and everything's chaotic and i think he's really trying to hammer that home yeah all right, and then to the next point, then he start goes from there, and then he kind of gets into basically the idea of governments being uh, to address encroachments is the word he uses a lot, which would be, uh, you know, if you're in our, our sphere, that'd be aggression uh, would yeah. be, you know, the, the term that we would use, but he uses encroachments. Um, he goes, in still short terms, legitimate and appropriate mission of governments is a defense and protection of the inalienable, inalienable right of sovereignty in every individual within his or her own sphere. And I believe, if I remember correctly, and maybe we'll, we'll go into that later, uh, I believe there's a line at some point with this where he says something along the lines of that, like, while he's obviously not a fan of coercion, if we're talking about the actual legitimate, uh, you know, or what is considered to be the legitimate mission of governments, then he doesn't have a problem with that. And I think actually a lot of, like, like anarchists in general wouldn't have an issue with that. If, if it actually legitimately was this institution that was, created to in a in a non-coercive manner address coercion then we wouldn't have an issue with that because i mean a lot of us pretty much damn near most anarchists have thought this through to the one extent or the other and how you know in a anarchist society we would address aggression or or such and i mean some anarchists do do like uh you know throw off any ideas of having any sort of institutions but i'd say the majority of anarchists that's not the case uh, i don't know if you agree or not but no, I definitely agree yeah. with that. I, yeah. I don't think I don't think we'd have as many anarchists if the state wasn't doing what it's doing now. <laughs> yeah. And this is probably one of the main issues that a lot of people looking in, not understanding anarchy have, uh, is they just think, oh, well, just no rules. Anyone can do anything, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, uh, yeah, yes, but no. It's like if I if I kill someone in anarchy land, that doesn't mean I'm not going to have issues. Like, yeah, it may not be a technically a government per se that, that uh, addresses it or whatever. It, it it could be a mob it could be a uh, tribunal it could be you know uh i don't know it could be uh they kick me out of the covenant community or whatever like a mob yeah so, yeah a mob yeah <laughs> which is that's very much like a sterner thing or it's kind of like <laughs> well you're like yeah like do what you want but uh other people are gonna do what they want as well so keep that in mind <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> like you're not just gonna stab someone and be like, "Oopsies, <laughs> whatever, no repercussions." <laughs> yeah, like, I, I think there'll be people who don't like you killing people. <laughs> so. Yeah, I don't think the neighborhood's gonna be very uh, happy that their neighbor was killed. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't have any thoughts on encroachments. We move on. We're kind of setting the stage. I know this is kind of boring. Um, uh, the 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 next thing is expedience, which I I thought it was important to mention because he just used the word a lot. Expedience. I think what he's getting at. Um, with expedience is just the idea like he, he uses this the word expedient may look loose and unsatisfactory but among all the works of mankind there's nothing higher than expedience um i'm trying to explain this was one that kind of threw me for a loop uh what he meant by expedience i think he more he kind of tries to explain it as the idea that like hey we have this principle of liberty or or you know how, how else would he put it 
um, you know, uh, of keeping this principle uh, uh, the highest. Uh, but there may not, his idea is that there are all different expedients. And the idea is to kind of find, this is the way I interpret it, because it is kind of worded uh, old timey, uh, is to find the best expedient and, you know, to everyone to use their own individual expedient. Essentially, it's the, I mean, maybe I mis misread this, maybe I'm a retard. But that's how I interpreted it. <laughs> so, but he does use it a lot too. Is the the idea is to find some way to deal with this issue in an expedient manner, and and there are different expedients. Is the way he explains it. It's fucking. I don't like the way it's worded. It's weird, but I thought it was important to yeah. note because it, it is a little lot. confusing. But yeah. from what I got, it it's like what we like the the it's people's boundaries and what is aggressive or aggression toward their boundary is different for everyone. Yeah. And we got to try to find that middle ground and what's not the, I don't know what's not in like, I mean, he goes into the examples and stuff, but like, that's what I got from it. We got to find yeah. somewhere where that lies. Yeah. That is a good point. Cause that is a thing I, and I didn't really go deep into the encroachments because that was one point that does kind of lead into the expedience. It's the idea that, uh, yeah, you did bring that up that, uh, that everyone's encroachment is different. Like he, he goes on a whole long uh, uh, bit on here, kind of the idea that, um, you know, uh, he uses the idea of that you, essentially your house is on fire and you, and you run by someone yeah. who has a pail of water and you grab their water and you use it to put out the fire. Like he's like, technically that's an encroachment, but the way he defines it is kind of like, well, it's only encroachment if the person determines it's an encroachment. Yeah. It's the same idea as if I kind of pat my buddy on the back, uh, you know, like, that could be assault. That could be a pat on the back. It really is up to, there's so many, and, and, and this is where a lot of people, we struggle with nuance, uh, especially a lot of, uh, in cap, you know, types and stuff. Uh, it's, it's ones and zeros. It's binary. Uh, yeah. but there is, there's open interpretation. If you're some person I don't fucking know, and I come pat you on the back really hard. I mean, there is a legitimate case sometimes under certain contexts. It's like, dude, that was kind of weird and not cool. <laughs> yeah so yeah, i mean if yeah. you're you can do it to your buddy but then like i don't know you do it to like a, a little kid well that's a yeah. big difference too yeah and yeah he does he is one point he's getting at the idea that everyone's uh, idea of encroachment is different and i do think he kind of loosely ties that into his like, concept of what an expedient is uh so the idea is to find something expedient for uh all everyone all together or not everyone but individually because everyone has different needs when it comes to what they determine encroachment some people might be more sympathetic because he even brings up the case of i think it was like someone stole your purse and like uh you know like you'd be cool with them uh you know you may be you may no longer consider encroachment once they gave you your money back and but for some other people maybe they would consider it encroachment still uh whatever um and, and that's one thing he does get into later in this is kind of like what do we do with all these different nuances and so many different ways to interpret it like how are we supposed to set these hard and fast rules of what is and isn't okay uh you know and and how do we deal with this and especially in a in something while upholding these values that he you know he put in place earlier um, uh, I don't know if you have anything to add to, you know, the encroachment experience before we get and move on. Uh, if not, uh, you did mention, yeah. er okay. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think we covered it pretty well, honestly. I mean, he yeah. goes and that he does spend a lot of time kind of deeply describing individual examples and stuff. So yeah. I think he'll get his point across as we go on. Yeah. And we're not going to go too in the weeds. Uh, there's, this is a. Uh, I mean, it's not a huge essay, but it's like 15 pages. But I mean, if you're expecting us to cover it in detail in an hour <laughs> to an hour and a half, you're you got you're, the wrong people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're totally mistaken. Go fucking read <laughs> the the audiobook's out now. It's actually a really good audiobook. Uh, so yeah, it um, is pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, have you listened to the whole audiobook? I mean, not to go on a tangent. Yeah, the whole audiobook. I, I haven't done the whole audiobook. I just got the audiobook. My last Audible credit. Uh, I had just been physically reading it. I mean, now I'm reading it and doing the audiobook. And dude, uh, everyone, every, I'm probably only like a third of the way through the audiobook uh, because I mean, I'm obviously I was reading this for the sake of this, so I haven't, I've listened to this one like fucking six plus times now. Um, so just to you know, you know, be spun up for it. But um, yeah, no, every so far, every reading has been phenomenal, and it's like. I don't know if you're a big audiobook guy, but that is is kind of rare when you get a good like a good narrator, and it's yeah. weird how like all of these are good. <laughs> yeah, but that and then I'm also kind of like I mean you know this I'm a podcast guy, so like yeah. I listen to like a lot of people that were in are on the audiobook or podcast that I listen to, so it's like r really cool if you're like in our sphere and you listen to those podcasts and you hear them pop up or just some other like podcast internet person and you're like 
well, this is really cool. Just I know who that is. I don't know. When I hear I hear someone, I guess a recognizable voice reading, it makes me drawn to it. I can get more out of it than if I heard some unknown person, I guess. Yeah, which I mean, it's funny that it's like partially the purpose of this because it's like this weird bridge between people who read and people who podcast or don't mm -hmm. read because it's like, uh, you know, here, here you go. Here's your little. And then also even for people who do read, it's like uh, sometimes it's nice to have a little bit of something to kind of like uh, go over what you read to kind of be like to help you decipher it. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, if anyone's been paying attention to this, I am I am in no way a lofty intellectual. So I feel like I create a good bridge between those groups. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I really like I listen to all your episodes that you do on this because I really like it because it I'll be honest, it puts it in lame man turns so I can understand. It. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think I said something like well over a year ago. I think I'm uh, the way I've described myself is I'm just a retard who reads books who describes them to other retards. <laughs> <laughs> So that's perfect. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let's move on to the next portion. I kind of want to talk about he, he, uh, this is at 16. He said, he kind of talking about, and you, I think either this might be before we started uh, recording or during it, but you brought up the idea that he, he is not at all saying that he wants to, cause he, he is setting this framework of a theoretical idea of his, you know, proposed anarchy or, or proper form of government, essentially, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Um, and he does go into like the idea of that, like, but I don't want to force this on anyone. And it, this is one thing he does reiterate. And I do think it's important because uh, while a lot of people may pick away at some of the ideas in here, you also have to, you know, couch that in the idea of that. He's, he's not saying that his proposed idea here is the end all be all. He's saying, hey, this is one possible idea of many ideas. Feel free to take up another idea. In the end of the day, as long as you, you know, like, as long as everyone's doing it voluntary, and th th I think that maybe you have said that line at some point, uh, the, you know, as long as everything's along the voluntary basis, um, I think he says some line like that. It, he's kind of like, whatever, I don't care. He's like, this is just one thing, and this is what he thinks could be a beneficial one. He's more just giving an idea. Um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll actually read it. First, then, while admitting this right of sovereignty in everyone, I shall not be guilty of the ill manners of attempting to offensively enforce any of my theoretical speculations, which has been the common error of all governments. This itself would be an attempted encroachment that would justify resistance. Even more so, to touch on this, I do remember at some point in this essay, he makes, and it's almost like a throwaway line, he says something along the lines, I believe this is when he was kind of talking about how if these theories were put in place, it would kind of evaporate the concept of war uh, in a lot of ways. And he goes into uh, he makes some line. I believe he was kind of getting at the whole civil war thing, and he kind of ended up essentially taking the Spooner approach, where he's kind of like, just let him secede. And he said some line along there like, uh, "Oh, if some if you were a uh, person driving a bus or whatever, I can, maybe that was the example, or maybe something else." And in someone on the bus in a voluntary world says, I want off this bus. You just, just let them off the fucking bus. Like, and that's, <laughs> like, and that's kind of was his point too. The idea that like, and it's not to say you uh, advocate everything they're doing, but in a day like you have no right to govern them uh, mm -hmm. or in, in the, in the sense of govern as into coercively control. Um, yeah. Uh, do, 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 I don't know if you have anything on the, uh, more on that one before we move on. Uh, no, I think you pretty much nailed it, dude. Yeah. I, I think, uh, yeah, I think he, uh, like you said earlier, um, that the whole voluntary thing, he kind of slides it in there. And actually kind of like why I really like this chapter is it's kind of like he nitpicks the like little tweaks he would make to the government as it stands. And then all those little tweaks that he kind of makes and he kind of brings it in and he makes it make sense too. Yeah. And then it, like at the end, all the, after those tweaks and he's like, oh, but this is just all voluntary. And it's like, but this is anarchy. <laughs> I like how he like draws it into that at the end. Yeah, and we're we're getting to that now. The next point I want to touch on is the idea um, is the idea that if we're going to have a government and they're going to be the thing that addresses encroachments, it only follows that they have an enforcement or you know judicial or whatever you know side of it, the one that actually does it. Which uh, he uses the term military, although I would say this probably would be military slash law enforcement. He's kind of using as a catch all term. Um, so he says the whole mission of course of government being the defense of persons and property against off offensive encroachments, it must have force enough for the purpose. This force necessarily resolves itself into the military for the advantages of drill and systematic cooperation. And this being perhaps the best form of government, 
uh, that government can assume, while a coercive force is needed, I make no issue with it, but only with the misapplications of its immense power. And there, there you go. There was a, my point earlier, which is the kind of same idea with, uh, I guess, governments in general. In a certain sense, it's not that we – I mean, we do have an issue. I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this correctly. It's the misapplications of its power. But now if this was genuinely an entity that was, you know, completely voluntary – and was using this, you know, power that we put into it in whatever way. I mean, I know this does get catchy because where does the power come from? Blah blah blah. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of it comes from the coercive nature of it. But you know, that aside, you know, if it was just go out there catching robbers and murderers, and it'd be like no one, and you know, somehow doing this on a voluntary basis, not taking taxes, whatever. Blah 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 blah. Then yeah, no one would have a fucking issue with it. Like none. Like you'd be like you know, our issue is all the other shit. So, yeah, uh, I do have a uh, – I'll bring it up real quick. I, I don't know. I guess you're bad. Oh, yeah, you were really pushing Bitcoin. I know everyone's all about that. Never take investment guy from a, advice from a guy named Carr or Typo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is where I get to be smug that I was never gone the Bit, uh, Bitcoin bandwagon. The only reason why is because I'm too much of a tech idiot to figure it out. Uh, I've been wanting to do it for forever. Mm. So, you know, sometimes like, being an idiot pays off. <laughs> me and Luke just – well, I'll just say this really quick, but me and Luke just did an episode about why we buy Bitcoin. And honestly, our whole reasoning was just because smarter people told us to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's why I do most things, honestly. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boom, boom. All right, cool. Yeah, Beck, that threw me off. Uh, appreciate the super chat, JC. Uh, yeah, so the, the idea is that the, you know, if we're you know, in this framework he's setting up, if there is going to be this, you know, government, if we're going to deal with encroachments in some way, shape, or form, it would make sense that, you know, you know, in a just government theory or whatever you want to call it, you would have a military or cops, you know, like the minor, like the minarchists would be like, you know, cops, military, uh, maybe borders, maybe the judi the the judges, Courts, whatever. Yeah. The courts, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but it's kind of leading to his next point that we're getting into. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I totally agree. Like, you know, no one would have a problem with any sort of voluntary system at, of any kind, honestly, even if we want to call it a government, if whatever. And if it was, if it was honestly doing the like good things that we'd want a government to do, like they at least they tell us they do, is like you know, protect us from robbers or murderers or whatever it is, then like no one, I don't think, I don't even think anarchy would be a school of thought. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that is the funny thing is like, uh, he did, um, like I, I said earlier, I don't think he ever referred to himself as an anarchist. And yeah. it's one of those things where if you read this, um, if you like, like he uses government so many times, but then if you like apply what he's saying, it's kind of like, yeah, well, it's kind of not, I mean, you're being a little bit semantic, uh, but it's the same idea. I remember who was it? It was a uh, there's another one in here. I believe it's the Herbert Herbert Spencer uh, one. And that one that uh, I might have the name wrong. Uh, but that one like it is interesting because it legit is like a essentially straight up a minarchist who any that it was like a section that they removed from his essay that, that you know anarchists found way later or from one of his books and essentially was uh, he was advocating for the right to ignore the state. Because and he he came at it from a completely like minarchist or a constitutionalist perspective, and it was like one of those like accidentally libertarian anarchist whatever type things, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is which is great. Um, uh, okay, cool. Uh, I'm trying to think, if there's anything else interesting to say on that? Because that is kind of the big portion that we're getting into. Uh, oh, here's another good line. Every individual should have should would have been free to entertain any theory of government, whatever for himself or herself and to rest it by experiment or test it by experiment within equitable limits. He goes on more and he, he really is just kind of like, Hey, you can try whatever government you want, quote unquote government. So long as it's voluntary, essentially is what he kind of gets at, which is like, you know, and if it's not voluntary, we'll have issues. <laughs> so, yeah. And, which is once again, he's kind of just, it's not even really, you're not even really talking about government, but I mean, it, it is kind of just semantics at a certain point. Um, yeah. It's almost like you sometimes can interchange government and society. Yeah. Because that's how we want society to be ran. Yeah. Oh, do, do, do. All right. One second. Who decides him? All right. 23. Uh, boo, 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 boo. I'm trying to think. I'm move next. Uh, I do think it's interesting. He kind of goes into this is one thing where it may have a little bit of an issue. 
uh, I mean, like I said, we're not going to go into critiques here, but he kind of goes into uh, how much violence is necessary. This is where a lot of anarchists might be a little bit like on the fe- on the on the edge, like, oh, what are we talking about here? Because he does kind of go into, and this is one thing he'll go into later in it as well, is that the idea of um, in this he'll build on this more, like I said, uh, when he gets more into like how uh, disputes are handled in his, you know, is given one and. Ultimately, he does kind of propose that it, it would be the gov- the military who would be the ones who would be the ones applying or, you know, cops, whatever you want to call them, would be the ones applying violence in certain situa- or force in certain scenarios. But, I mean, this is after like a weird stringent process that he goes through. And even then there's kind of like an out, which we'll get into more. Um, yeah. Uh, do, do, do. And but this is also like couch in the idea that he will. I mean, I think we might go into this a little bit more, but he goes into how like the the military in this given in this given situation that he how he he puts it is almost like this thing to be lauded. It's like this. It's almost like this thing that we that normal people imagine the military or the government to be when it in reality is not. Uh, you know. So let me see. All right, all right, twenty five. All right, I like this one. It will be asked, what could be accomplished by a military organization? Uh, and I guess I probably should a uh, little bit preface this is one of the aspects, and we kind of been toying around this, uh, is what, and we've been kind of toying around this idea uh, or, or hinting at it throughout this of what the little tweaks he would make. And he's kind of, he's implying here the tweak to the military being that instead of, you know, being in the military, you say, you get your orders from your boss and you say, go do this. And you're supposed to go mm-hmm. fucking do that. Uh, and in his idea, it, the military would, even the subordinates were allowed to judge of their own. Um, yeah. So, and which I know it sounds dumb because uh, it doesn't apply to any other job, but he's talking about a government entity. So it's a little, I mean, to be fair, it's a little bit different. Uh, he says, it will be asked what could be accomplished by a military organization. If every subordinate were allowed to judge, of the uh, propriety of an order before he obeyed it. I answer that nothing could be accomplished that did not commend itself to men educated to understand and trained to respect the rights of persons and property as set forth in the Declaration of Independence. That here and here only will be found the long needed check to the barbarian wantonness that lays towns in ashes and desolates homes and hearts for brutal revenge or to act office uh, or a little vulgar newspaper notoriety. Which uh, I think I mentioned earlier, this was post civil war. So that does come in play. I did want to pause. And I think me, me and you have a good, this is a good spot to kind of talk. Um, cause me and you, we were, we were both active duty military. Um, you were Marines. I was air force. Uh, you were like Intel or some shit like that. I believe, yeah. uh, as an aircraft mechanic. So neither of us were combat. And, and even then, I feel like even a lot of the combat guys might be able to relate to this and, you know, in contrast to the civil war. So a lot of stuff that he's getting at in here is is a lot of the crazy shit you hear about in war, like you know, uh, you know, villages being burned to the ground, women being raped, you know, children killed, shit like that. Whereas a lot of times when when I read this, the things that come to mind is more the bureaucratic nature of yes. the government and shit like that. Um, and I did find it interesting because there is something to that. Obviously, he's using the context of like, hey go set fire to that church. And in his, in the context he's saying is that in his anarcho military or whatever, they would, there would be a guy that would go no. And then they would go, and then everyone else would go, okay, well he said no. So we're not doing it. Like, or, you know, everyone would judge on their own individual merit. And this is actually something they teach you in the military too. Uh, I don't know if you remember, it was like law of armed conflict, shit like this. This is stuff they tell you, but then I mean, uh, a lot of times uh, shit they teach you gets thrown out in practice. Not to say I've ever set fire to the or fucking, killed people overseas or some shit like that like uh yeah but- like they go under like not fall like uh not you don't have to follow an unlawful yeah. order and they kind of drill that into you i mean they did do that early into us but the whole like definition of an unlawful they don't really go into the definition exactly of what an unlawful order is and it's kind of applied here or there in the military i would say yeah it's it's very iffy um so like yeah technically you are like able to not follow unlawful orders but it is one of those things that's like weird. Whereas, um, you know, what Warren is kind of getting at is almost a complete culture change in the idea of that, like what military and, you know, police would be for would be legit, would essentially be, you know, liberty 
uh, fucking evangelists almost, if you will. Uh, but you know, they, they would be the ones who would be trained on all this shit. They're supposed to be the ones that if he even talks about like in training them, that they, you should give them scenarios in their training and like to kind of like intentionally be like to fuck with them, to kind of get them to, uh, develop their own, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, own will, I guess maybe, maybe way to put it, uh, uh, essentially the balls to kind of stand up to leadership occasionally to be like, no, I'm not doing that. Which, um, you know, I, I guess kind of what I want to get to a little bit is, uh, I guess there's two points to this. Um, I find it, I did 11 years act duty. I, I, you did one enlistment, right? Yeah, I did five years. Okay, so did you even hit uh, like E5, like NCO ranks? Uh, well, I was E4, which is okay. NCO in the Marine Corps. Oh, yeah, I know Marine Corps is weird in the Army. Uh I don't know what, but anyways, uh, point I was getting at, God, I had a fucking brain fart. I have a point. Damn it. Oh, I know. I mean, being more in like leadership, I, I know that there is, there's a lot of times where the bureaucratic nature of the way this fucking entity works is to be a good leader. You almost have to break the rules. Like you oh, just have yes. to like, Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I think that's almost like common in any military branch where like you're i've heard plenty of guys that even had on my podcast and stuff that will say their nco staff and COs would you know let them bend the rules a little bit and almost like that's what builds the it, it's like a bond because it's like something that you can't break because you could go rat on him and get mm -hmm. him in trouble and then he could get you in trouble but so in the military it's almost like creates a bond that can't be broken because it you're both risking your kind of your careers in a way yeah which i guess in a weird way this is almost a i mean we talked on sterner earlier this was a point he talked about on in uh in, in i don't know if it was an essay it was an Anarchist hymn book but it was in the uh it, it was definitely in the uh book uh that there was an excerpt from he does go into the idea of own will and then state will or he calls it ego will i, I forget how he frames it the idea of like doing what you're told just because you're told and then like kind of thinking for yourself, kind of the difference. And, uh, you know, the, the, he even has a great line is kind of like the idea is to like, never let the state be your plumb line, be, essentially be like, like, yeah, you may do what the state wants you to do occasionally, but that does don't ever let that don't ever confuse that with be you're doing it because the state's telling you to do it. You're doing it because whatever it falls in line. It's kind of like, I don't kill people because the state tells me not to kill people. I don't kill people because it's I, I don't want to kill people. Like, and mm -hmm. it's, it's that same idea. And yeah, there, think, the, go ahead. I was gonna say in the I think earlier in the book in the beginning he kind of puts it maybe maybe it's in around here actually I don't remember exactly but he actually talks about like individuality itself and the reason that individuality it's an American concept I think it even mentions the Declaration of Independence your own sovereignty. So like if the military is this overarching structure where you have to do exactly what it say, you lose the individuality. And in his mind, you're losing the Declaration of Independence, yeah. the democratic process. You're losing America at that at then. Yeah, no, that's a good way to put it. Like because in the uh, kind of the point I'm getting at is like I know being when being in for so long and especially being in more leadership positions, you learn that the best leaders are tend to be the best individuals, the most mm. individualistic people. Um the people who will, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'd have a boss and it wouldn't even necessarily be a bad guy or anything. He'd be, he'd be like, Hey, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. And in my head, like, you know, I've done this job way longer than him. Uh, he just happens to be in higher rank than me. And I, and like in my head, I like, I know I'm like, dude, that's fucking retarded. Like that's not going to work or, or, <laughs> or there's this better way to do it. And I cannot tell you how many times I just go give him a nod and go, okay, yes, sir. And then I just do whatever the fuck I was going to do anyways. It, and then, yeah. Like... <laughs> There's a lot of that. There's a lot of that in the, and that I have found in the military. And, uh, well, I think like the, for some reason, the military has a hard problem of, of always being stuck in their old ways. And then mm -hmm. it's, I, maybe it's because it's just the bureaucracy behind it. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe the culture plays a part in it, but when there's like, like, one way they've done something for so long for some reason they want to stick to that same way uh instead of like you know you maybe knowing that you're, you came into whatever air mechanic or whatever and you find out oh there's actually a faster better way to do something but for some reason leadership and maybe the bureaucrats above want you to keep doing it the old way for some reason and i don't know it seemed to me that anyone that tried to ind individually stick out to better the environment, his career, the job, whatever, the unit um, 
uh, would be the best ones, but then sometimes those best ones would even be somewhat punished or shamed. Sorry, I blew in the mic real quick. I, I, I accidentally unplugged my mic, so I wanted to make sure it's still working. <laughs> you sound um, good, dude. Hell yeah. It's still good. Yeah, I had to check it real quick while you're talking. Like, I was like, man, I hope he still has more to say. <laughs> <laughs> I do it all the time on my podcast at the cover for Luke. <laughs> it's like, please keep talking. Please keep talking. Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, yeah, I was getting at that there is something to that. And I also think, I guess – in a certain way, I actually think, like, obviously, I me and you, I don't think either of us would ever suggest people join the military or the government in general. I mean, maybe it depends what you're doing. If you're like, if you're like Buck Johnson and you're a firefighter, I mean, I have a hard time finding any qualms with that. I mean, like, yeah, you know, it, they've completely created a monopoly on it. So it's like, I, and, and even then, it's not like firefighters are the ones, you know, like fucking you know, shooting Duncan Lemp in his sleep. So it's like, I mean, how, yeah. how upset can I be? <laughs> yeah. Or t- take like uh, the sewage department. Like that is a necessary for uh, society. You need to have that. But for some reason, the government has a monopoly on it. Yeah. But the, the point I'm getting at is I do think there is something, and I don't think this is necessarily what he was getting at, but in a weird reverse kind of way, it's almost the same thing is I actually think, more people should embrace that if you are in this position if you are in the military your cop whatever what have you i do think you should embrace some more individual thinking this is something i think you should do in general but i actually think this is in a way is something that will improve the world and in a weird way i mean i guess improve the government in the sense that we're talking about it in the sense that warren's talking about it i'm not saying to make it better in the sense of that uh, it is kind of weird because i i Essentially, my point again is if these people embrace more intelligent ways of doing things, I think these do lead to better results. I think people start thinking more individually, individually, whether it be, you know, a cop, uh, what have you. I do think this leads to better things. And I know a lot of people be like, oh, well, I can't not follow that rule or what have you. And like, I can't think of an example immediately come to mind. But I know from being in the military, there are plenty of times where there'd be some rule or something that we're not supposed to do. People do all the time and just the sheer force of enough people don't do it or certain people do it or, or do or don't do it, that it just kind of is null and void. And in, in like, I mean, this is a thing that happens in, um, in general when it comes to like the government laws, but even while you're in it, I, I do think there is something to that. It's, and I'm not saying break all the rules or get yourself in trouble. I'm just saying, uh, I mean, you know, be a little bit smart about it. If you're like, I mean, maybe don't get yourself fired on the first day because you're like, fuck you, I'm not doing that. But, you know, have a little bit individual. Don't completely just fall in line because someone says this, this, that, and this. Uh, think for yourself. Apply, you know, critical thinking. Um, you know, is this moral or, or is this thing the better way to do X, Y, and Z? I just think it's a better better way of going about it. And in a weird kind of way, you, I do think it almost, you know, obviously, like, it would never work this way, but, like, let's say you got 90% of the military to behave in this manner. I do think in a certain sense, you'd kind of get what Warren is pushing for in some way here. Um, Yeah. And, you know, I, I've heard this a lot, um, especially in my time in the military where um, leadership, especially when I was getting out, was asking why I was getting out. And I would just, you know, speak about my problems I have with the military. And a lot of times, especially if you wanted to make some sort of change, they would tell you that the best way to change the military is stay in, pick up rank, and change it from the inside. Now, I, I didn't really agree with that for my personal self, but people that are still in that, I think that's definitely, there's a lot of truth to that. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying you're going to, like, end all the wars or, uh, you know, stop all the well, bring all the troops home from every base we're occupying, whatever. But there is something to where you can actually have some sort of effect of the culture inside. Because, I mean, I don't know how many different units you went to, but each unit I went to kind of had its own culture and how they mm-hmm. did things. And especially whoever's the commander is and the first sergeants and whatever and how they want to run things. But if you, but, and there was already kind of like cultural norms at the units when I showed up where it's like everyone knows we're supposed to do this one thing but we kind of just don't do it and no one says anything about it. And I can't, I, I wish I could think of an example off the top of my head, but uh, there's definitely a lot of that where if you kind of, as a group, especially as a group, if you have where you can kind of push the boundaries of what you think you're allowed to do and kind of change the culture, that definitely has much more effect. And so 
lot harder for them to uh because the military likes to single people out and make an example out of you but if the but it's if it's only one person in the unit it's easy for them to like take down one person and and shame them in front of the company but if it's a whole unit or a whole like just say a whole platoon that's going to make the unit look really bad and that that will reflect on them and they know that so then they'll be much likely to work with you or kind of just let you get away with whatever you're not or doing yeah and it is funny uh i don't know if you ever deployed or anything but there, there are certain situations i this necessarily have to be deployed but there are some certain certain situations where you can see how this works out is like this this is the first example that comes to mind it's a little bit silly but I know when I was deployed, like we'd be working long hours, busting our ass. And it, I'm pretty sure it even said in the uh, manual or, or, or in the AFIs or some shit is what they're called, uh, that if you're on uh, 12 hour shifts or more for extended periods of time, essentially deployed. And I think it's specifically deployed locations. Um, you're allowed to sleep if you don't have shit going on. And people would do that. But there, it was all the time that leadership, you know, especially uh, officers, brass, would get all uppity and then come bug people and be like, you know, you need to wake up. And like, obviously like there were times where we would post up the AFI on the, the on the wall to be like, fuck you. Like we're allowed to, uh, <laughs> you know, according to your own fucking rules, but they kind of just do whatever they want. But you know, they would obviously, you know how the, the game goes and then they'd be like, well, well, yeah. I'm sure I can find something for you to do or some shit. Like, you know, technically yep, there's yep. work to be done or whatever. Uh, but point being is that I, I remember, and it's always stuck in my head. Cause I just, for one, it was funny. And it was also a great example of how like, how uh, dynamic the the dynamics of like uh the the military or just organizations can work and i remember there was a i believe it was a captain so i mean like in in the officer world that ain't shit like and like they, they that's usually where they start getting uppity and think they're shit yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna <annoy laughs> and i remember one of them came up to some dude who was sleeping and he like slapped him on the leg he's like get up and i believe it was like some like e6 or some shit so like some dude who's been around for a minute yeah. and I just remember like the dude, and this was like an area, like in the break room with all the fucking grunts, not, not grunts. I mean, we're, we were, so we weren't like, we weren't fucking like, yeah, I get what you're but, saying. But all the fucking peons, the, the grizzled fucks that were actually yeah. doing the manual labor while this faggot, you know, was hanging out in fucking <laughs> <bedrooms>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, like and, and like all of us just kind of just like stared and no one moved a, a bit. Like, cause you know, a lot of times you'd stand up, or, or, you know, oh, yeah. go to parade rest attention. No one moved. Everyone just glared at him. And I just remember the look on his face because it went from this, like, hard ass, like, I'm in charge to, like, oh, shit, I am not. Oh, yeah. Like, it was very awkward. And it was kind of this, like, he did kind of have this, like, false bravado still. But you could tell just by his, like, body language. It was, like, all deflated. Like, just everyone just yeah. eyes like daggers looking at him. No one moved a fucking bit. Like, if anything, we just looked like we were about to jump him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a really good example, actually, of how, like, because – I mean, in a, you know, the perfect picture military, at least what he's kind of describing is like, then that guy, once he got slapped in the foot, would stand up immediately and everyone would kind of be like, oh shit, like the officer demanded something. We have to, you know, do everything we can to appease him. And in that little moment, like he kind of, kind of, kind of like an authority check. It was like, your authority only goes so far. You do know that, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you do learn, especially when you, you've been in like higher, like there are ways to, really fuck people <laughs> mm -hmm. they did not like me near the end because i got good at like uh at shit like that where i i learned how to fucking like uh how to um use their rules against them <laughs> yes so, yeah. yes dude that so, it, that's the probably the biggest advice i would give anyone in the military is know the rule book because you would probably know the rules better than them and the, they're just a lot of time they're just front and dude like half the time most people in the military have no idea what the fuck they're talking about they're just pretending like they do and if you actually know the rules you can turn it right back against them and they have no idea what to do because that's the rules yes and a lot and people always assume so often that like uh the the higher up is is got there by some sort of merit or yes. is someone were some someone worth respect if that mm -hmm. makes sense or someone impressive because you, if you're someone who's been you know did one enlistment and you you're an e3 and you see someone who's an e8 like th there is some aspect of that you're like oh my god that dude has probably been in like 20 plus years he's seen a lot of shit that doesn't mean a goddamn thing like that doesn't mean anything really does not. <laughs> like, like <laughs> there's so many there's so many times that i've uh, like 
like uh, especially lieutenants i don't know what it is but like, when second lieutenants like first show up i don't know like the oh one the bottom of the like the literal absolute dog shit like even enlisted consider oh ones is dog shit like no one really cares about them and they show up and they get all uppity all in trying to get their whip their dick out in front of the unit making sure everyone knows that all this is the new shit hot lieutenant and they immediately get put in their place by the staff and co's and it's honestly and they do it publicly sometimes and i kind of enjoy to watch that <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's it's great stuff but yeah yeah the point being is that there, a lot of times these people are not impressive like this is some person yeah. who has a government job that's not very hard to do uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not. I'm not saying that it doesn't have its struggles or exhausting at times. But it, it's not that hard. Like most of this shit, you know, it, pretty much government work in general. So I think you'd be surprised, especially if you're someone who hangs out in the sphere as we do. I don't think me or you are geniuses by any any stretch of imagination, but we fucking like can skate circles around most of the fucking. Uh, especially mid-level to uh, to even some of the higher level leadership that's in like the military. There, it, it is a lot of this false like you know elitism essentially, if you will, where it's like eh, I don't know. Really, mm -hmm. it, it, okay, you're some dude who did 20 years in this position. Uh, if anything, I mean, yeah, don't get me wrong. There can be impressive people to do that, but I feel like impressive people don't do 20 years in a government job that doesn't require a lot of uh, work <laughs> or a lot of. Yeah. Uh, brain power I, I just can't tell you how many times i've like uh you realize they're not that intelligent and you'll check them and if you do it correctly it, uh, it's it's fun but all right uh enough of that i want to uh all right I, I, here's one quote that uh, kind of applies to kind of what we're getting at here uh a man cannot in alienate his inalienable inalienable right of self-preservation or sovereignty by joining the military or any other combination the assumption that this is, a, is possible has produced all our political confusion and violence and will continue to produce just such fruits to the end of time. The childish blunder is not exposed and corrected, which is, you know, kind of plays. I mean, I, like, I, like I, I've stressed a few times, it does definitely play more to a lot of like Civil War stuff he's talking about the time, but also applies to, you know, kind of modern day stuff as well. But yeah, he, he's definitely getting at the idea that like, you know, just because you're in the military, it's kind of Nuremberg trials type shit. Like, you know, just following orders doesn't really, it doesn't yeah. mean it. like, okay, <laughs> you can kind of justify anything. Admitting this indestructible right of sovereignty in every individual at all times and in all conditions, one will not attempt to govern, but only guide or lead another. But we shall trust to principle or purpose for a general and voluntary coincidence and cooperation. Military officers will then become directors or leaders, not commanders. Obedience will be all the more prompt because it's rendered for an object. All right. Did you ever go to leadership school while you were in the military? Uh, I went to corporal's course, so like NCO school, I guess. Okay, cool. That's basically we, what's called ALS for us, Air, Airman Leadership School. And I do – I don't know. I actually put out a tweet the other day and I, because I don't know why I was thinking. I think it was actually because I was reading this. It reminded me of that. It said uh, – I, I said, uh, what did I say? I said military leadership training is is a lot like uh, uh, being taught uh, proper form at CrossFit. A lot of great information there, but you throw it all out the window as soon as, it, <laughs> as, soon as it's time to That's do it. That's a anything. good way to put it, dude. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Like, it's funny that last little bit where you're talking about there is that actually reminded me a lot of, like, military leadership stuff because they do go over all this. It's weird. It's almost like the military has these two concepts at, at, at odds. It's this idea of military and orders and, you know, this is what you have to do, blah, 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 blah. Uh, this is the boss. He is in, you know, you're, you're governed by him to put it in his, his terms. Whereas, but then you go to leadership training and they teach you to be an effect, how to be an effective leader. You, you learn the strengths and weaknesses of your, your subordinates. You don't have to be, if you have someone who's better at X task, you it may even sometimes behoove you to step aside and let that person lead or, or, you know, like, I, I don't know. I learned a lot of good stuff from leadership training actually. Like, but the funny thing is a lot of it does go at odds with the shit that actually comes in play in the actual military. Um, and it's a lot of what he's talking about here. The idea of how, uh, entities work and the idea that we have this weird uh, authoritarian ish structure of the military is kind of weird. If you think about how uh, entities are supposed to work, you know, teams and it doesn't really work out that well, if that, if that makes sense. Um, have you have anything to add to that one? Yeah. Just there, I found a lot of things that they like, 
don't get me wrong like i have a lot of resentment toward the military but they also do teach some valuable lessons and and they're pretty good at teaching some things um and but the hardest i think one of the hardest things to grasp is the the how many times there's uh confliction with what they teach you on what they tell you and or con more like contradictory i guess yeah so they kind of tell you one way but the culture that's already kind of set in place is going in kind of a different way so it's like uh, yeah, they can kind of, they kind of teach your like sort of like individual, like know your subordinates individually and know their capabilities individually. But then when time comes, you, there's not always the chance to work on their individuality because they, I don't know, there's just something else you have to do and they kind of want you to do this and that or, and it yeah. conflicts with like trying to get the best out of your subordinates because they want you to do some other dumb military bullshit because of some yeah. bureaucrat. Which is another thought I was having a while ago. I couldn't really think of an intelligent way to put it. Uh, you know, this is just a thought I was having the other day. It is, it's almost like, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's necessarily in, intentional or that it's necessarily even completely accidental or some, it may be some mix of the two or something just happened to work out that way. But it's almost like that's the perfect recipe to destroy a human beings individuality is yeah. to teach them the right way to do something or the, or the, you know, the, the, the most intelligent or, you know, or whatever way to do something and then have them in practice do the exact opposite. And then somehow simultaneously hold these beliefs uh, at the same time, because and, and it, I don't know, because I mean, from my time in the military, I, 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 I like, there are a lot, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of people I met in the military who impressed me. I, I don't want to get, but there are also a lot of people. It's like this weird, like dichotomy where it's you just kind of end up like going to one extreme or the other there actually are a lot of impressive people in the military but there are also just as much very unimpressive people where it's like it's weird it's almost like the middle got hollowed out which it's almost like <laughs> yes. this like it's the same and it is kind of ties back to what i'm talking about here whereas if you do this it's almost like you create this thing where people either fall in line or become more individual, more individualistic. Like, so it's like you either create like, you know, e even better men or you create uh, better slaves. <laughs> like it's one of the yeah. two. Like, it's like trying to instill American individuality into an authoritarian organization. And it's like this constant conflict where, you know, people, I mean, and, and, and there is like this, and this ridiculous gray area too. And especially as a young person going through the military, that gray area is so big that you have no idea really what's right and wrong at first. You just, yeah. and I think that's a lot of times too, because of the new, you don't know anything, you're new. And if anyone higher rank basically tells you to do something, you're going to do it right away. And then you kind of learn after like probably at least a year or two that, well, there, there's actually a lot more wiggle room for you than just like, yes sir or yet being a yes man all the time and yeah uh, I, I think it's weird because there is that kind of culture that conflicts against like but i don't know it's weird because they yeah like you said they tell you one thing you do another but in the culture's just weird and it's just it doesn't even make sense because either the person in charge used a complete retard or actually like a really cool dude and yeah. so you, you never know what you're gonna get it's a yeah. jack of all trades in there. Yeah, and uh, you did bring up another good point that I didn't even really think of, and it adds another element to this, is the idea that typically these are young men who are going into it, young men that haven't done much in their life, are, you know, looking to set themselves, you know, uh, you know, set themselves up as, as you know, as a man, as a, as a whatever. They're, they're basically beginning the path of their, you know, adult life. And then they get thrown into this. And it's also important additionally embroiled with this you know national uh or society's typical idea of what the military is uh of that it's this thing you go to that will make you this fucking it'll help you get your shit together it'll make you a fucking man it'll make you a strong man it'll make you make you this it'll make you a good leader blah 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 and these are all like actually kind of sort of partially true sort of you know kind of like we got out before it's like that that is a thing that can happen but you can also come out like, you know, just like some fucking uh, sheep, you know, just like anyone else. It, like, like I said, it's kind of like you end up being one extreme or the other, as it seems to be. But it, it definitely is. It, 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 they do catch you in an impressionable time when you're coming there expecting to get one thing. And so everything that every experience you have, especially at the beginning, is to some extent colored with that expectation of what you're thinking you're going to get from the military. So, yeah, yeah, which is I don't know. There, there, it's it's. 
I mean, I'm sure maybe there's some intentionality to it. A lot of these things are just things that happen, but it is like, whether intentional or not, it's borderline fucking evil. Cause it, it, it's, it's this weird thing where they take, you know, young men's warrior spirit and desire to become good men and completely corrupt it. So yes. Yeah. yeah. Your idea of what the military is. And I'm a family of my fam. Most of my, a lot of men in my family are veterans. So the idea of my whole life, the stories and then like Hollywood movies and the culture around you, they have this idea of what the military is. And that idea really can cl- conflicts with reality when you're going through it. And then you kind of, you don't know, you don't even really know how to digest it because it's, I don't know. There's just so much differences in it. And, and what your recruiter didn't really tell you uh, the whole story of what to expect in the military. Yeah. Uh, and here's another good quote uh, that he kind of gets at, which, you know, plays into exactly a lot of the same elements we're talking about here. When a high degree of intelligence, great manhood, self-government, close discrimination, real heroism, and gentle humanity are known to be necessary to membership in our military corps or government, these qualities will come into fashion, become the characteristics of these people. And, and to be thought destitute of them and unworthy of membership in the military would cause the greatest mortification. It's because it's funny because like that is kind of what people think is the case, but it's not the case. So, and that's kind of, I guess, sort of what I'm getting at, where if you are the person in that situation and you do live up those ideals, in some way, you're kind of creating the virus within the government that will sort of take it down in the, in the sense that Warren's sort of getting, obviously I'd say get out when you can, but if you're already there, you know, these are the things to do, I think, you know, to exemplify those traits and, you know, be your own person. And I think other people will catch on, uh, be, uh, you know, kind of like we talked about these two divides. I think I actually vaguely remember I had, a. I might have broken down to two or three classes, but I had a uh, Shane Hazel on forever ago in my early episodes. And I remember okay. we, we talked on a lot of this and I essentially boiled it down to the military creates two types of people. Uh, they create uh, or not creates it, it attracts slash sort of also kind of creates over time of uh, warriors and cocksuckers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, but I, I would just say like, you know, a lot of people like, You know, a lot of people think big, like they're going to change the world or change the whole uh, military or whatever. And like, realistically, that's probably not really possible. But when I, I mean, I, even my one contract, I had subordinates under me and I could literally change their whole perception of the military and the culture and pretty much their world. Because like we talked about earlier, it's like as a young person, you don't know who you lean on the higher ranks because you, all you know, is they have some experience. They have a, they have experience uh, depending on how high they are, and but and that's all you kind of know. So that's why you listen to them right away because they're they're been here. They wouldn't give them captain for no reason. At least that's what you think. <laughs> and, and, it's not like they just existed. <laughs> yeah, it's not like they just promote everyone to sergeant, right? Like what? And, and but 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 seriously though, when you are if you are in that role as some sort of small unit leadership, like you could really change the lives of I don't know four marines and like hell maybe one of your marines ends up being like the sergeant major of the marine corps or whatever and then like he kind of has i mean i'm not saying he'll maybe he I, i'm sure actually become sergeant major at the buy into the bullshit a little bit but at least he has some sort of individuality or someone that spoke this kind of stuff and culture in into him before so maybe he takes that in consideration or hell maybe that's what made him get the sergeant major yeah, this spirit of individualism or individuality or whatever, I th- I do think it to some extent uh, spreads and catches on. So, I mean, and then when you see people like me and you that leave, it's like I do think those people who were touched by you, I do think like, I mean, whether or not you've had a long-winded conversation about your reasons or whatever, I do think sure. uh, that kind of plays into it. Like, why is this person that I, you know, always treated me with respect, I felt like was a good leader, knows their job well, et cetera, et cetera. Why do they not want to be here? And I'm earlier in my career and why yeah. – you know, like, why should I stay? Like, you know, I, mm. I do think these things, these types of things have effects. I think they're important. Um, so, yeah, I uh, think little, just little things like that can have big changes. And in, 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 at least in someone else's life, like you can't save everybody, but you can save one person. That's a lot better than most people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's move on to, uh, I kind of want to get into his idea of like counselors. Or actually, I think he might have referred to them as tribunals or councils at some point. Um he says deliberate bo- deliberate bodies such as legislatures, congresses, conventions, courts, etc., are not scientifically 
uh, speaking are not government, which is simply coercive force. And I believe this is kind of, I brought that up because it kind of begins the point of what he's getting at is that he's kind of doing the same thing here with like, he's kind of talking about with his anarcho military or cops or whatever. He's kind of getting at almost an anarcho court uh, essentially is what he's getting at where he's getting to these councils, uh, whatever. Uh, and he, I mean, I'm not going to read every little bit, but I'll give a summation. The idea being, um, you get counselors and essentially these would be the things like, uh, and like I said, you would kind of be hacking the similar thing. I think that's why he's getting at the courts. He's, he's almost implying you could almost just like repurpose them for this use. Uh, you could have, you know, lawyers, judges, whatever you create councils of people. And, and he doesn't, I don't think he ever really strictly, uh, you know, gives a very, like I said, all these things are, he's just like rough ideas of like what it could be. So it doesn't ha it's not like this perfect, you know, follow this exact formula. Um, but uh, someone just asked me when we get Miss Marvel episode reviews. I didn't even know they had Miss Marvel. And while I'm a comic book nerd, Miss Marvel looks like I was never interested in Miss Marvel. The, uh, I mean, so no. But anyways, um, God, that threw me off. Um, but uh, yeah, he's talking about repurposing those. And the idea being you would have people that essentially would – get their names out there, you know, like say, you know, the good examples like a lawyer uh, saying, Hey, I handle these specific things. You get these people together. They talk about, and this would be in a given thing. Like, I don't know. So you have two farmers uh, and there's a dispute upon where they're fucking uh, dude put his fence. He said, Hey, you're 20 feet into my property or whatever. I mean, uh, maybe it's not the best example because he's because uh, of his, you know, his weird thoughts on property, but whatever, we'll use that for now. Uh, and you would get a council of people together. They would, you know, kind of, you know, these would be people who would be known for being intelligent on these specific things. Uh, they would come to deliberation. Uh, you, I mean, this very much as a lot of shit you see in a lot of anarcho type stuff when they're talking about like courts or in an anarchist system. And they would come to the deliberation of some sort. And the idea being is that b preferably both parties come to an agreement. Uh, and they go, okay, I'll accept it or I won't. So, and you know, these people would get further in their you know careers as counselors or whatever by being more apt to getting a uh, getting a result that's favorable for both parties uh, because we I mean, don't want to fuck over one or, or the other. I mean, the idea is to come to some sort of agreement that everyone can be good on. But I will say, and this is where you guys get iffy. Um, they they say that if there comes to a point where they cannot come to deliberation or they, the, the council has come to deliberation and they fuck it. And no one or, or one party or the other uh, or both does not agree to it, that that would be the point that they would bring in the uh, military is what they call it. So, you know, cops, military, whatever uh, he yeah. kind of uses as a catch all. Um, and that would be the point at which they would, depending on the situation, because this wouldn't be suitable for all situations, would apply force if need be. And I will say you have to couch this in the idea of all this shit he said before about the military, because here's the catch is, and, and me and you may still have issues that I still kind of have issues with it. Sort of. I don't think it's ideal, but this is just a proposed idea. Uh, he wasn't saying this is the way, but uh, is at that point, uh, if there are individuals within the military or whatever, the, the enforcing agency who says, no, I'm not okay with this. Uh, then th they're allowed to do that, you know, by the shit he even played out earlier. So there is this idea that like you have multiple layers of like essentially yeah. protection to, to, to the most degree possible prevent any sort of coercive uh, thing happening whatsoever. And, and yeah. to be fair, I mean, we're talking about in a situation where likely there was some sort of encroachment or aggression or some shit. So, I mean, yeah, we may be hesitant to apply force in this situation, but there are some situations where it's like, all right, well, your daughter is locked up in his basement most likely, so I think maybe we should go get her. Like, I mean, I, okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I, the way he words it, I do, I do have a little bit of uh, cause for pause in some of it, but it, it is you do have to couch on the idea of that, like, he already completely went his whole his whole concept of the military and how that they all have the ability to and they've all essentially been propagandized into the proper idea of liberty or whatever you know so they are these like yeah. perfect anarcho military cops or whatever <laughs> so, like, um, yeah i think yeah I, like i think 
because of all the layers he kind of stacks on top of it, the farther you get into the chapter, it's like a lot of nuance. <laughs> like there's a, there we're, we're in deep now, but uh, no, like, you know, like the idea itself, like, you know, sounds like a, some sort of a better system is like, you know, pretty much everyone kind of just voluntarily, like there is voluntarily agreements for everyone involved, like the council, the even the both people that are in a dispute, and even the military itself. So it's not even like, you know, say the council decides whatever agreement and one person's not happy and they bring the military in to apply force, but then for some reason, the, or the cops or whatever, the cops decide like, oh, uh, yeah, we're not enforcing that because we don't think that that's uh, justified or whatever. So it is like almost in a better way of like kind of separating the council and the state. And that, and that is kind of like uh, uh, what we want essentially is separation of those powers. So it's not all in one uh, apparatus altogether. And I, I do like that idea of separating these things out because so, it does add layers like that. And he referred to it, I believe, as like the democratic principle, which, I mean, it, this is another semantic thing because a lot of us will hear democratic and think mob rule. He's not getting at what he means is democrat. He means democratic in the sense that a free market is democratic, if that makes sense. Although, I mean, that's not really, I mean, it really does come down to weird terms. He more means that in like, you know, it's it spread out, uh, decentralized, I guess would be the key word, whatever, you know, the, the way it works. And I, I also do think it's, a, he has mentioned multiple times, uh, and I think this is something he said with his expedience thing, is the, uh, and I think he said something along the lines, I think he says, called the absolute principle of right. And the idea, and he, the way he frames this, this is something you should keep in mind as your highest, uh, um, uh, what's the word, principle or attribute to go towards. Uh, and so at the point, he, I think what he's kind of getting at is that, yeah, maybe not all of these are perfect, but this is what we're striving for. And even implies multiple times that like some of these may not work, or maybe I faltered some way and like, and it doesn't necessarily hold true to the principle, the, the principles of, uh, of rights or whatever. But, uh, you know, like the, the idea at the end of the day is we all should be striving towards that. So, uh, to, you know, if we got to make corrections to my little fucking, little little idea i have here of how this could work if if this isn't uh, suitable if you have a better one use that like so mm -hmm. yeah i do think there's something to that um well i think we're kind of at the end i don't really know if there's anything else was there anything else you wanted to mention about this uh is there anything else that you that struck you throughout your reading uh can i just read the very last line yeah i was gonna read the last line but you can have it yeah all right uh so this is the last one 87 um, if others see this only the inauguration of anarchy, let no attempt be made to urge them into conformity, but let them freely and securely await the results of demonstration. Yeah. And I, I like how he ends that. And he, he does, I like how he frames it too. Cause like we've mentioned multiple times, he never really called the anarchy. He never really called himself an anarchist. He, he literally he was couching it in terms of government, but in this like, in this kind of like, you know, uh, you know, just theory of government, essentially that a lot of anarchist constitutionalists, whatever have you. So in his point, point is kind of like, it's almost like this like Chad thing, like, okay, you want to call it anarchy? Like, okay, uh, whatever. Yeah. Call it anarchy. But like, well, how about you see how it goes first? And then, we'll, like, you know, like, yeah, I, yeah, I like it because it's like, um, it's a, a lot of, uh, I like it just based on the, like the voluntary, like he kind of really hits that and each individual has their own rights and sovereignty and all that. And there's no encroachment. And he kind of basically like kind of gets, a, I mean, he at least gets close to the idea of anarchy in this whole chapter. And, and I, I think he's kind of saying like, whatever, like you want to call it, fuck, call it communism. Who cares? I don't care. Whatever. If, as long as it's the same thing, like whatever. Yeah. And, I like, and I like the idea too, because it's like, um, you know, government forces their government structure ideology on the people. And he's like, well, if we're going to have some sort of anarchy or, or whatever type of government he's explaining, he's like, just let it happen and let people decide if they want to be a part of it. Like almost, almost opening up the idea is like, you can just choose whatever type of society or government you want to be part of. Yeah. I do like a point you brought up uh, uh, just in there, uh, the idea of that, like, 
You know, if you want to call it communist, if you want to call that, and, and this is actually kind of a through line through this. If you want to call it anarchy, if you want to call it government, if you want to call it this, you know, as long as it's like kind of fallen into these things, like who cares? And I, this has been a through line that I've noticed in all these anarchist handbook ones. Don't get me wrong, there are a couple of them that really fucking kind of get under my skin uh, as an ANCAP. I'm like, oh, that's pretty fucking off. But honestly, it's probably only like one or two of the essays. Uh, there are a lot of these people that I thought I was going to go in hating because, you know, I had never read them before and they were an anarcho socialist or a mutualist or whatever. And I thought I was going to find something reprehensible about their beliefs. But a lot of times you find that a lot of these people are describing the same things, or even if they are describing things that they, there are disagreements upon, they're usually not coming at it from this like cunty place of authority of like, I'm right, you're wrong. And even then, like, you know, say with a lot of like the labor theory of value type stuff, a lot of time is not like this thing that like, they use as a building block to reach some authoritarian fucking endpoint. It just is some like part that me and you just be like, yeah, well, your economics aren't great there, but whatever, you ended up with the right conclusion. So who cares? <laughs> like, yeah, uh, there's a lot of that through here. So yeah, I think there's like you know, uh, we we see the, like at least my opinion because I mean, dude, I when I started my podcast, I heard like the term like libertarian socialist or like an anarcho communist, and I started laughing. I was like, that makes no sense. And I was like, yeah. what are you talking about? And I had no idea the history or anything. But, um, and then now, like, you know, I just kind of thought because of that, those labels attached to them, like they're, you know, they seem like they're supposed to be like my enemy, you know? Yeah. And, but after like reading, learning more about like more lefty anarchy types, like honestly, like, they, almost everything they describe is like kind of what I want. They're just using different terms. Like they're just yep. trading out terms and kind of, I mean, they wouldn't, they wouldn't say it the way I would, but at the end of the day, it's like, Oh, that's pretty much what I want. Like if we were doing that, I probably wouldn't even complain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like the whole capitalism socialism thing. It's so often that you come to find out you're just talking past each other. And if you're like, just to find your terms, you'd be like, wait, we're saying the same fucking thing right now. Yes, like, it's yes. like you just have, <laughs> You just have, by my given perspective, a retarded way of understanding this word. And I'm sure you probably think the same thing about me. It's kind of like, well, yeah. Okay, can we just like use this definition and move past this gay ass disagreement? Like, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, once I like basically learned that a lot of the lefty anarchy types, that, like it volu uh, being voluntary, is still like one of a lot of their top priority. Then I was like, oh, I'm sold. Like, right there. Like, I don't really care. Like, if you want to, I mean, we always say it, like, whatever, if you want to go live on your commune and do mm -hmm. communism, but it's all voluntary with all the people there, and I'm over here living in, in Kapistan or whatever, then fine. Like, let's do that. That sounds great to me. Yeah. Well, with that, I think we're at a good spot. I, I really enjoy this episode. It's been a fun one. Uh, if you want to go ahead and drop your plugs again so people can know where to find you, uh, so on and so forth, that'd be great. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mainly use Twitter. Um, so at the real typo, I actually name my name is down there for anyone that wants to see it. But uh, at Biting Bullet Pod on Twitter is our podcast page, and we pretty much just post memes on that and up uh, when we release our episodes. And if you want to check out my podcast, it's Biting the Bullet Podcast. It's on every major podcatcher. I'm not going to list them off. Yeah, uh, yeah. I always just say every major one. I don't actually know if it's on every one. I just say it is. So neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got them all covered. Uh, yeah, I appreciate everyone who showed up for the stream. I uh, appreciate all my patrons. Uh, with that, this is the No Way Jose Show. You can find me on YouTube, all the major audio podcatchers, Odyssey. Uh, follow me on Twitter at twenty twenty No Way Jose. I finally broke three K after my fucking nuking. Ironically, right at the time Reed got nuked, so that's fun. Um, you know, I stole some of his power, I guess. Uh, if you want to give me money, I like money. Patreon.com, just no way Jose 2020. Like, share, subscribe, comment, do all that shit that helps me out with the algo. And I appreciate everybody. And I hope to do more of these soon. I got, I'm trying to work some other people. I have a couple of leads, but we'll, we'll see where this goes. Uh, appreciate that. We are out. Okay.